It's able to speak to us today on parameterized complexity of quantum invariance of knots. Thanks so much. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So uh, indeed, so we'll see a construction of um, a certain type of topological invariant for knots called quantum invariants that are algebraic and combinatorial in nature, which makes them nice for computations. And so I'll particularly describe a parameterized uh, algorithm to compute them efficiently. So let me first introduce some notions. <clears throat> so when I'm talking about nodes, I'm talking about embedded, uh, embedded circles in R3. So when you have only one component, it's called a node. When you have several, it's called a link. And also there's a bit of a refinement to this that, um, that's called a ribbon. Somehow, where you take consideration of the orientation, so you uh, you see the uh, arrow head here, uh, giving you an orientation of your node component, and you also look at twists uh, in your ribbon. So that's why we use ribbons for that. It's a nice representation. But uh, if you draw it as a curve, you will have a little twist like this, meaning you have a framing. So you you have some kind of uh, you have this idea of torsion in your uh, node component that's given by an integer, giving you the number of times you twist somehow. So these are uh, refinements of the theory. So sometimes you would like to have uh, a topological invariant of nodes, but sometimes you would like your topological invariant to take into account the orientation. Uh, so if two uh, nodes that are similar as topological objects uh, have different orientations, you may want to uh, say that the invariant gives you different results. And uh, same thing for framing. Uh, anyway, so these are uh, details. So we we'll mostly look at uh, oriented nodes uh, with framing today. OK, so what kind of invariants are we looking at? So uh, when I say quantum invariants, uh, I have in mind like particular families of them. Uh, but they all come from a similar construction. But the most famous, the most famous family of uh, quantum invariants would be the color Jones polynomial. So you may have heard about the Jones polynomial itself, uh, which was probably one of the very first uh, quantum invariants to be introduced. And then you can generalize them into an infinite family of uh, polynomials uh, in square root q and um, uh, one over square root q. And so. Um, uh, these are polynomials with integer coefficients, and they are parameterized by this uh, n here, this capital N, which is an integer, positive integer, uh, bigger than 2. And so you would recover your uh, classical Jones polynomial when n is equal to 2. <clears throat> so why are we looking at these objects? So these objects are properties that are independent of the way your node is represented. So if your, if your node up to isotopy, this invariance does not change. So first, they are very powerful to distinguish between nodes that are non-equivalent. Uh, in particular, <clears throat> uh, they are conjectured to recognize the unknot. So the unknot is simply uh, an unknotted curve. And it's one of the very big challenges in computational topology to find an efficient algorithm uh, to recognize the unknot. And they are also connected to uh, like more far-reaching conjectures, uh, particularly beautiful, uh, I find. So one of them, which is maybe the most famous, would be the volume conjecture. So you have this limit formula uh, that looks at your, uh, your infinite family of uh, Jones polynomial, evaluated on a certain root of unity. And, uh, and you push this toward the infinity, and somehow you manage to recover uh, a fully geometric notion attached to your nut, which is the hyperbolic volume. So the hyperbolic volume is defined by uh, looking at the ambient space in which your nut is floating and uh, digging out the nut. So you end up with a three-dimensional space with a, uh, um, with a boundary that comes from the nut you've removed. And this you can attach a hyperbolic structure to it and you can talk about the volume. And this quantity somehow controls the asymptotics of your color Jones polynomial. So, What's particularly fascinating with these conjectures and other which have the same philosophy is that they connect objects that are uh, completely different, different in their nature. So we have a pretty good understanding of what the hyperbolic volume means, but the Collagen's polynomials are a bit more mysterious because their definition is 
uh, very combinatorial in some sense. Um, so these conjectures are, um, are keeping researchers in topology quite busy. And so being able to have efficient methods to compute this kind of invariance would actually help us uh, check conjectures on larger scales, have more experiments to, um, to check these conjectures and maybe uh, elaborate new ones. <clears throat> so that's a bit of uh, motivation for studying these invariants. Clement, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. So for this uh, volume conjecture, is it known to hold true for any particular knots or families of knots? Uh, yes, there are families of nodes for which uh, it's been uh, it's been checked. So okay. it's a bit easier. I mean, some nodes um, uh, have triangulations for which we uh, very well understand what's the hyperbolic structure need to look like, and uh -huh. at the same time we also can find uh, close forms for the Jones polynomials as well. That's so that would be, for example, like a, a simple example where you would recover it. Um, but it's a very challenging task to prove in general. Right. All right, so, um, so how are these quantum invariants defined? So this slide is a bit complicated and formal, but um, it's, it's actually, it boils down to two points. So you start with an algebraic object, uh, which is called a strict ribbon category. So it's basically um, an abstraction, a categorical abstraction of uh, what the category of uh, modules uh, look like together with uh, their tensor product. So when I will be talking about strict ribbon category, just think about modules over some ring R and their tensor product. So essentially for what I'm, gonna, I'm going to present, we need, well, a, a notion of tensor product. So if you have two spaces, module or objects of your category, you can take the tensor product and define a new object. And you can do the same with morphisms, define new morphisms between tensor products of objects. Um, <clears throat> and you have a notion of duality as well. So if you have an object V, then you also have a dual V star that satisfies some extra assumptions. So that's, um, that's like a model on the category of modules. And you also have, that's quite important, distinguished isomorphisms and morphisms. So, uh, so one is called the natural braiding. So it allows you, it goes from uh, U tensor V to V tensor U. So it's, uh, it's a kind of permutation, except it's a bit more involved than that. Uh, you, need, like, uh, you need to define a certain one that's, um, uh, that's a bit more involved. Anyway, you can think about it as a matrix uh, between uh, two uh, free modules, the tensor product of two free modules. And you have also like other uh, distinguished morphisms like called the co-evaluation here that goes from some kind of unit element into uh, V tensor V star and some evaluation that does the other way around. So V star tensor V into the unit objects. Anyway, so think about a category with tensor products, some uh, distinguished morphisms, and that's it, okay? And so this will allow you to give some um, graphical computational rules that will turn a uh, knot or a knot diagram into some form of equation, into a morphism. So you will jump from the world of topology uh, into the world of uh, morphisms and algebra. Uh, so that's how you define the, the invariants. So <clears throat> a bit more concretely, so this transformation is sometimes called the Pen uh, Penrose functor. So if I give you the diagram of a uh, link, so here you have uh, two components, um, you can present it in a more uh, grid-like fashion where most of the uh, strands uh, are vertical, except for a few exceptions uh, that uh, consist essentially of twists and maxima and minima. So you can actually separate these, uh, these features uh, with small boxes. So as you can see, I put boxes where you have uh, vertical straight lines, but also where I have crossings. I isolate all crossings. Uh, I have twists as well here that, comes from, that come from the framing. And here I have a minimum, I have a maximum here. You get the idea. So you can put your uh, diagram into this sort of uh, canonical uh, form. And um, each box will actually 
consists into a morphism when we apply the Penrose functor from a diagram into uh, the straight ribbon category, think modules and morphisms, each, each box will be turned into a morphism the following way. So I attach an object of my category, a module, to each of my node component, okay? So now when I look at a box individually, I have uh, entering strands and leading strands, uh, and these strands will be colored with these modules V and W. And so that would give us uh, the morphisms we are looking for. So here you have the, a certain box F with uh, entering arrows and leading arrows. And that significates that uh, it's a morphism from the tensor products of the colors of the bottom arrows. So here you see the domain would be V1 tensor uh, all the way to Vn for uh, the bottom arrows. And uh, it will have value into the tensor product of W1 to Wm, which are the arrows on top, okay? And uh, we get some computa uh, computation rules for that. So if I put two morphisms next to each other, uh, this is equivalent to the tensor product of the morphisms. So I can merge boxes that are next to each other on the same horizontal line. Um, I also have the composition. So if I have a morphism on top of the other, I can take the composition and I get another morphism. So these are equivalent, uh, algebraically speaking. So these are the general computation rules of uh, the Penrose calculus. Um, <clears throat> and so now I will give specific uh, morphisms to the specific features of my note. So a straight vertical line is the identity. Um, a twist coming from the framing would be the twist morphisms of our category. Um, <clears throat> and then crossings will come from the braiding. So this one is the most important one. And as you can see, so if I have um, at the bottom strands colored V and W, uh, and at the top I have uh, strands colored W and V, my uh, braiding morphisms will be from uh, V tensor W into W tensor V. So we indeed permute the positions of the two, uh, the two uh, modules. Can I ask a question here? Yes, of course. So uh, when you introduced this previously on the other side, you said somewhat informally that you might want to think about this as a matrix in between. Does that analogy carry over to where you're switching the roles of V and W to thinking of possibly a transpose of the matrix? Um, so, uh, hang on, let me come back to it. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Well, you actually, you had it defined there, but if you, oh, sorry. can you see my cursor? Uh, no. Okay, fine. So when you define B, uh, you go from U tensor V to V tensor U. And so mm -hmm. you're just flipping the order of the components there around the, yeah. uh, the operation. And you indicated mm -hmm. that uh, you, one might be able to model this by a matrix. And so yeah. my question is, if you model it as a matrix, does that transposition of the arguments correspond in any way to doing a transpose of the matrix where you're switching the rows of the okay. uh, columns and vectors? Okay, so um, so I, I guess, yeah, you would send uh, the element small u tensor small v into the element small v tensor small u. Is that uh, what you have in mind? Like the, yeah, okay, so you could do that and get the structure of a straight ribbon category, indeed. Like you could have like vector spaces and that would be a simple example of a straight ribbon category, except uh, it would not give you any interesting uh, not invariant. Uh, why is that so? If you do it simple, because you would not be able to see, so we were here, so, um, so as you can see here, for a certain crossing, I have a C, a V, W. But if I had the other crossing, so uh, where the strands are, instead of going on top of each other, it go, uh, one goes on top of the other, or one goes under. Okay. Yeah. So you would not be able to see the difference between these two mm -hmm. uh, okay. with a morphism like that. So eventually, you would be able to do the computation, but it would give you a trivial uh, not invariant. Right, so the real punchline here is this is more sensitive in terms of determining the crossings, whether they're over or under crossing, and that's the whole game here. 
Exactly. So that's why you need. Uh, so if it's an under or um, over crossing, you would get the morphism C V W or the uh, opposite of it. And then okay, you need the great, you need the uh, sorry the inverse. So you need the inverse to be non-trivial. Okay. Great. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. So um, all right. So you have a morphism for this, and you also have morphisms for uh, maxima and minima, and they all come from the distinguished uh, morphisms of your um, of your category. Anyway, when you have all those boxes, uh, and you can take tensor products of morphisms that are uh, on the same horizontal line, then you can compose all of this. And you get the morphisms from uh, nothing because you start with minima from the I mean from the unit element one. You compose everything all the way up um, your nut, and then at the end, your um, uh, the image will be into again the unit element because you you will have maxima, and you will get the morphisms from the unit element into the unit element. Okay, so I'll give you a complete example uh, right after that. But so you just need to get uh, the, the global ideas of the computational rules here. Uh, and what's quite beautiful with this theory is that you can actually prove, if you go the other way around, you have the, an algebraic equation, so morphisms composed together, then you can prove they are equivalent by uh, doing graphical calculus and modifying your knot. So assume my properties does not depend on the way my knot is, is presented. So I can isotope my knot the way I want. So if I compose these two uh, morphisms on the bottom left, so this is a crossing, this is an overcrossing, followed by another overcrossing. So this is topologically uh, trivial. You have the corresponding ray that must move on the right here. So if you do that with morphisms, then you want your morphisms to be equal. So if you compose two morphisms here, you want to have the identity. If you want your property to be invariant uh, for your knot, you need these equations to be satisfied. You can have other uh, uh, moves. So if you take the following one, so that's another ray that must moves. So if you, uh, if you have two twists of the following fold, uh, form consequently, then you can straighten your, uh, your knot here. So again, if you compose these, nuts to, uh, these morphisms together, you need to get the identity. So one needs to be uh, the inverse of the other, and so on and so forth. And so in the language of straight ribbon category, you ensure that your uh, distinguished morphisms satisfied a certain family of properties of this kind. And that's how you get a knot invariant. All right. And so this is the, the work of um, Reshtekin and Torev. So if you have a strict ribbon category and you apply the Penrose functor on a knot, then you get uh, a property that's invariant by isotopy of the knot. And so here on the top, you have another example with the full computation. Uh, so you start from the unit element. And then you compose, first you compose uh, two uh, minima uh, two minima morphisms, uh, so with the appropriate colors on your strands, and then you compose with the identity for the left strand, a crossings for the two middle strands, and the identity for the right strand, so they give you this tensor product of morphisms. Then again, something similar for, for this level, you compose with this, and at the end, you compose with the tensor product of the two uh, maxima, and then you get again uh, the, you end up in the unit element. And so you, you get at the end a morphism from the unit element into the unit element. And in a strict ribbon category, and in particular, let's say in the category of modules, uh, the unit element will simply be the uh, one dimensional free uh, module. So um, isomorphic to the ring itself, the ring of coefficients. So you will get a morphisms from the ring to itself. And that's going to be a multiplica multiplication by a scalar. And this scalar will be the knot invariant you are seeking for. Okay, so that's how you define quite abstractly um, quantum invariance deduced from strict ribbon category. But the construction is really so the, the proof of Rashtekin is to enter Rev is to just ensure that your morphism satisfied enough properties to be invariant when you. 
uh, applied rate MS to moves. And that gives you an invariant by constructions. So uh, if you're invariant for uh, these combinatorial moves at the bottom, then you know you are an invariant for your nut and you're done. So you just need to check properties locally to do that. All right, so that's, um, that's how you get uh, quantum invariants uh, with graphical calculus. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, why, why the word quantum? Uh, that's because the, the nicer, I mean, one of the very efficient way to get uh, examples of strict ribbon categories that have a uh, non-simple um, braiding, so this permutation morphism. So <clears throat> the way you get examples of strict ribbon categories uh, that have complicated uh, braiding morphisms would be through the theory of quantum groups uh, that comes originally from physics. Uh, they were used in, uh, in quantum physics to study some phenomena. Uh, and they, they come from the representation theory of Lie algebra. Uh -huh. But so uh, you have, a, uh, you have a, um, a recipe, if I give you a Lie algebra, you have a recipe to turn, like to slowly get, uh, to construct a strict ribbon category from it by uh, constructing certain braiding morphisms, uh, usually called an OR matrix or related to an OR matrix. And, uh, and you can construct your strict ribbon and get your morphisms with this. So the case of the color Jones polynomial is actually issued from the representation theory of SL2C, the Lie algebra. Um, Thanks. So that's, that's the name quantum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, that's for uh, quantum invariants. Um, and so in practice, in the algorithms, uh, our objects, U, V, and so on, will be uh, free all modules, or you can even think about vector spaces. Uh, and the morphisms will be uh, matrices. Uh, so we'll, have, we'll take tensor products of matrices, we'll be composing matrices or multiplying matrices. Uh, so that would be the model for the algorithm. So I'll come back to it. But so finally, so I promised some par parameterized complexity. Uh, so the parameter will be used is the uh, calving, width, uh, calving width of a graph which is particularly interesting because it gets a topological meaning when you look at planar graphs. Uh, so on the left here, you have in black uh, a planar graph, and you have a set of Jordan curves that uh, decompose it into uh, components. <clears throat> and that gives it this, um, 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 this, uh, this set of curves will give you some kind of uh, tree-like structure um, corresponding to the curve. So each edge in the tree, uh, so start like each leaf is a node in, uh, in the graph, and each edge corresponds to a Jordan curve. So in another way, I can say that an edge here in the tree uh, corresponds to a cut uh, in the graph that's uh, represented by the Jordan curves on the left. So, <clears throat> so that gives you an, uh, a tree-like uh, decomposition that has uh, several advantages. Uh, first, it is connected, very rela related to tree widths um, up to the degree, but uh, on a bounded uh, degree graph, uh, it's up to a constant uh, equal to tree widths, constant factor. Uh, but contrary to tree weeds, we know how to compute it in polynomial time on planar graph, which is very interesting for computations. <clears throat> so um, these decompositions um, are called calving decompositions. Um, and uh, the calving weeds, uh, so the weeds of such decomposition would be the maximal number of intersections between the edges of the graph and any of the Jordan curves that gives you the decomposition. So if you look at the blue curve, for example, it intersects the graph four times. And uh, that would be the maximum, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think the, the maximum number of intersection between Jordan curves and the edges of the graph would be four. And so the width of this decomposition would be four. So that would be your parameter. And the calving width of a graph would be the minimal width over all possible such bound calving decompositions. 
So um, you've shown us this example to illustrate the tree structure, which is very nice. Um, how do you decide where to place the Jordan curves? Um, so there's a uh, so there's a construction for that. You can actually define um, uh, you can define the carving decomposition more abstractly on graphs that are not planar, and um, but you can prove that on planar graph in a constructive way you have such nice uh, tree decompositions where each edge corresponds to a cut in the graph. So the cut would be given by, so if I look at this edge here, the orange one on the top left, mm -hmm. it separates in the tree, uh, the three leaves here, the nodes, I mean, there are some nodes in um, uh, in the graph. Oh, sorry. Uh, they are uh, the three nodes here, let's say they would be uh, these three nodes here on the left, and they separate the three nodes here from uh, the five remaining ones on the right. So these are the other ones. And you can, uh, on planar graphs, you know, I mean, up to some um, uh, not so bad restrictions, you know that you can find the composition where a cut in the tree corresponds to a cut in the graph. So the graph that is spanned by the three, uh, the three uh, nodes here on the left and the five nodes on the right would be um, um, separated in the graph. Okay. So so. What I'm understanding is there's well-established criteria, and because if you look at just this picture, it seems almost like a, a line that had slope one going from uh, left to right uh, could cut out the two vertices on the far right and uh, with the Jordan curve and leave the others. And it, it's not obvious up front why that would be better, but essentially what I'm hearing is there are there are good criteria to do that. Sure. You, I mean, you could uh, you could always define one, of course. I mean, if you if you swipe through, you would always get a cut, and you would be able to find a uh, carving like the composition. It may not be optimal though, but uh, with the the criteria, you know that there exists an optimal one uh, with this Jordan curve property. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So that's going to be the decomposition we will use. Uh, and we will exploit the fact it's quite topological in nature, and uh, and the parameter will be the calving width, of course. Um, all right, so let's uh, present the algorithm now. Um, <clears throat> so first, uh, some hypotheses and restrictions, because we talked about strict ribbon category. This is too abstract of an object if we want a computational model. Uh, so the input. Uh, the input of the problem will be a node diagram. So that's a, a drawing of the node uh, in the plane with uh, under and uh, over crossings. So each node component, if you have a link or like, uh, each node component will be colored by an object of the ribbon category, uh, as we did earlier to define the invariant. And we are given a bound carving uh, decomposition, which is not a problem because we can compute them in polynomial time. Okay. So we fix the category, uh, the strict ribbon category C, and we restrict our attention to uh, objects being free modules over ring R. And then we represent mat uh, morphisms by matrices uh, between these free modules. So one such example again is the color Jones polynomial, where, uh, and that's important, the ring is actually this polynomial ring here over uh, the variable square root q and one over square root q. So as you can see, the, the, the ring is actually not that simple of an object. So that's also a bit of a difficulty for computations, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but we can still handle it. So that's the color Jones polynomial. If you, uh, so indeed you had uh, this polynomial ring modules uh, of dimension big N, if you want to compute the nth colored Jones polynomial. So you have a bound on the dimension of the uh, free modules. Uh, and you, if you have a node, you only have one color, which is U. Uh, then your morphisms are indeed uh, matrices uh, with polynomial coefficients. And so if you look at the braiding morphisms, you would have n square by n square matrices if you are in dimension n. Uh, if you look at, look at the twist morphisms, you're going to get n by n matrices and so on and so forth, you get the ideas. 
And so finally, and that's uh, one of the key parts, uh, we can both use uh, fast algebraic computations when we multiply matrices, so that's quite normal, but we can also help ourselves with ambient isotopies of the knot, because we know that if we perform an isotopy of the knot, uh, we will change the, the set of morphisms we need to compose, but we know by definition that it will not change because it's an invariant of the knot. So we, we have this uh, new degree of freedom that comes from uh, the very nature of the problem. All right, so it's um, it's basically a bottom-up uh, algorithms in the tree decomposition. So you start at the leaves, and then uh, you have the inner nodes where you need to compose morphisms. So starting at the leaves, we can actually, uh, it can boil down to four configurations that are pictured here on this slide. So uh, in the carving decomposition, each leaf corresponds to one node in your planar graph, and a node in the planar graph here is a crossing. And so you can have a, a positive crossing or negative crossings. Uh, or you can have a crossing can actually be a, a self-crossing, which would be a twist in that case. So you have the four cases here, positive and negative uh, braidings and twists. And one convention we'll maintain during the algorithm is that we want the morphisms we maintain to always be from the unit object into some space. But we always want it, uh, we always want the domain to be the unit object. So that's why here, by isotopy of the nut, we slid all and uh, all, sorry, all strands to the top part of the morphisms here. Okay? And so if you want to compute this morphism, it's very simple. You can uh, compute uh, the tensor product of BU star with BV. You compose it with the identity for these strands, the cross in the braiding morphism here and the identity here, and you get the morphisms for this leaf. And you can do the same for the other ones. So you just brute force compute your morphisms. <clears throat> and you can do that by a constant number of matrix multiplications. So this way you get a morphism at each leaf. So this is how you deal with the leaves. Now, uh, what about the inner nodes? So when you look at an inner node and the corresponding Jordan curves, uh, you get con the configurations you have on the left here. Uh, so you have two edges, E1 and E2, to which you've been able to compute a corresponding morphisms. And then you have the Jordan curves, the Jordan curve that merge them together somehow. And um, <clears throat> Depending on how you order your uh, your strands, you get uh, three configurations. This is a bit of a technicality. Let's look only at the first one. So uh, you have these boxes here corresponding to morphisms, and you have strands between them, and then strands that go outside the outer Jordan curve. So if again you want to maintain a morphism uh, from the unit object into some space, you need to slid the strands to the top part of the box. So that's what we did here by iso isotopies. So here we just turn uh, the circles into boxes and we, uh, we slid the strands to have endpoints on the upper box. And you can do that for all configurations. Um, so that's, uh, that's a more canonical form we can work with. Uh, the problem we can't work with it directly. So, here again, we have the, the first, um, uh, the top uh, configuration. And so what we are going to do is to slid the strands under the box to obtain this configuration. So this is just an isotopy. So if the strands wrapping around uh, the part of your nut, you just slid it under and you end up with this configuration uh, with an extra twist here on the space V. <clears throat> But now all our rows are actually uh, leaving F and going up. And if you have several, uh, several strands in parallel, you get the configuration you have on the right. So because you are in, um, in a carving decomposition, you know that the number of intersection between the strands and the Jordan curves is small. It's the carving width. So you know that the number of parallel strands you have here uh, is bounded by the carving width. 
So when you do such operation, you only add a quadratic number of new morphisms that comes from the new crossings and the new twists you add when you slide under. Uh, but you only have a quadratic number in the carving width. So again, that doesn't uh, increase the complexity of the problem much. And so uh, you can uh, so you can basically again uh, compute naively, multiply the new matrices here you have, and just compose f your morphism f with the new twist and and crossings you've added, with only a quadratic number in the carving widths of matrix multiplications. So this uh, this new configuration is easier to study now. Um, so any question about this uh, operation here? It's just putting the um, uh, putting the morphisms in some kind of more canon canonical form to respect the fact that all the morphisms we maintain are from the unit object into some space. Okay, let's continue. Um, so now all our morphisms are of this form. So when we want to merge two morphisms, we have this configuration. There's no uh, strands wrapping around like they used to be. If, they, uh, if strands connect one morphism to the other, they do it in a bridge-like fashion, like here. Um, <clears throat> so you have the two morphisms here corresponding to uh, the inner nodes. So you've already, by induction, computed them. And then, so some of the strands uh, keep going outside to the outer Jordan curves, and some of them are bridging from one morphism to the other. And again, because we are in a, a carving uh, decompositions, uh, you have this inequality. The number of spaces that, that go to the outer Jordan curve, so the spaces uh, V and Ws, so they, they are I plus J of them, but it has to be smaller than the carving widths because that's the number of intersection with okay, the so outer. Sorry. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Was there a question? I'm not sure uh, who that was. Come oh. on, I would proceed. They okay. can ask again. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So um, yeah. So I, I was bounding the parameters here. So uh, I plus J is small, it's a carving width. And uh, also I'm going to assume that the number of strands bridging from G, G1 to G2 is smaller than half the carving widths, which is not true in general, but I have an operation, uh, I have a trick uh, where I can actually flip the box G2 here uh, by 180 degrees uh, in uh, uh, counterclockwise uh, direction in order to inverse the problem and um, and uh, get rid of these difficulties. So I can assume k is smaller than half the carving width. So once I have this, I need to compose somehow uh, these morphisms G1 and G2 with this bridge to get the outer morphism that goes from the unit element here into V1, uh, tensor VI, tensor W1, tensor w, WJ. So the first step uh, is represented by the gray box here, uh, will consist in uh, turning all these uh, maxima into the uh, evaluation morphisms we had earlier and compose them together. So this is represented by this operation here. I have a morphism here, F, and I have a strand going over, and from F, I want to get H, which is just the composition with uh, the maxima, uh, the evaluation map here that goes around that. This is the factorization uh, that I can do with matrix op uh, operations. Uh, and so I get this. Uh, I get a nice expression for this morphism as a matrix. Um, it's actually, it's more of a, uh, a row vector here because you go from a space into uh, nothing. I mean, into the uh, the the ring. So I factorized this morphism, and now I'm going to factorize G2 with uh, this uh, super uh, evaluation morphism here, uh, represented by the gray box. And to do that, I just need to study this operation. So I have two morphisms partially connected, 
one has uh, elements uh, going down, one has uh, some domain going up. And again, you can do this uh, operation. You can study in more detail this operation with matrix multiplication. So I would just comment about this. It's just technical and not particularly deep how to do that. But so I can compose them. And now again, I need to compose G1 and H. Uh, so it's a slightly different uh, topology here. You have this operation. And again, uh, you can compose, the, compose them nicely um, with some uh, matrix operations. Anyway, um, so that's uh, that's the factorization scheme when you are in an inner node of your tree decomposition. So we've treated the, the leaf cases. Uh, now we know how to uh, factorize uh, morphisms when we are at tree nodes. And then you just percolate uh, bottom up through your tree decomposition. And at the end of it, you would have the entire morphisms from the unit element to the unit element. So you would actually get a one by one matrix, which only coefficient is the invariant you, uh, we are seeking. So maybe some quick comments. Uh, so yeah, so there it is. Uh, once you merge two, uh, uh, two morphisms, you get only one. It's a nice form and you can keep going in your tree. Um, all right, so a very quick comment about uh, how you would implement that concretely. Um, so we know that the spaces, uh, the V, the U and the Ws are um, by assumption have bounded dimension. Uh, so in some way, this bounds the dimension of your uh, matrices. So if you look at this, for example, when you do a matrix multiplication, you usually have, let's say, one crossing or one evaluation or something of small size, uh, I mean, bounded by a polynomial in uh, the dimension of your spaces, and a lot of identities tensored with. So that gives you very sparse matrices. And if you study them a bit, uh, a bit carefully, you can actually see that you, you don't really need to do actual matrix multiplication. You can find um, formulas, exact formulas for uh, the values of your coefficients if you were doing a matrix multiplication explicitly. So you don't really need to do that. And this accelerates, of course, computations uh, by a big factor. But essentially, the comment here is that matrices may be large, but they are very, very sparse. Um, so, uh, how large are they? Uh, because we are in the carving decompositions, uh, we never treat more than uh, a big O of the carving width strands together at the same time. Um, so, your matrices, if the maximal dimension of uh, your space is n, and because the tensor product multiplies dimensions, uh, you will never get matrices bigger than n to the power of something proportional to the carving widths by n to bigger of the carving widths. So your matrices are quite big. They are exponential in size, but, the, uh, but they are exponential in the carving widths only, which is fine for parameterized algorithm. And so indeed, all your morphisms are of this form. And so that's how you can implement efficiently um, your matrix multiplication without doing matrix multiplications anyway. And also one comment also, a detail that's important in that case is the arithmetic complexity, because here we are uh, dealing with uh, complicated rings and essentially polynomial rings uh, like this one here. I mean, polynomials with also negative powers anyway. Um, so here you could have issues. You do a lot of matrix multiplications. But the issues you could have is uh, first, your coefficients, your integer coefficients may blow up, become gigantic, uh, as you would do maybe with fast exponenti exponentiation. So you have this arithmetic complexity factor. And on top of that, you have difficulties with the degrees. The degree may, may as well blow up. Uh, and so you would not have uh, your arith arithmetic uh, operations would not be constant time anymore. They would actually become problematic. But you can actually get around this. You do. You can do uh, some generalization of Lagrange interpolation to always reduce the complexity and uh, compute things modulo some prime numbers. You have techniques from abstract um, from a, a, a computer algebra that will help you doing do this. So as operation arithmetic operations will always remain polynomial time. 
So this is, I mean, these are the more uh, technical, uh, these are the details of the implementation. So that's why it's not interesting to develop on slides, but um, it goes through, it's, uh, it's just technical, it's not particularly deep. And so in conclusion, if you put everything together, so this like complicated statement is just uh, pick a ribbon category, you have a node, compute, uh, compute the invariant. We can do this in, uh, if you consider a node diagram with n crossings, which is the, the size of the input, um, and carving with CW here. If you have this, you just compute a bound carving decomposition of it in polynomial time. So I didn't put it in the, um, in the complexity. Once you have this, you can compute your invariant in polynomial in n, the size of the input, uh, n to the power of three half the carving widths, where n is the dimension of the modules you color your node components with. So in the case of the nth color Jones polynomial, the n would be this n here, indeed. So the Jones polynomial would be, uh, the normal classical Jones polynomial would be n equals two. So you, you would have two to the power of three half the carving widths. Um, and in terms of memory, you are exponential, but just in n to the power of the carving widths as well. This is due to the fact we are maintaining uh, morphisms during uh, the tree traversal algorithm. Um, and so in particular, what's quite interesting, what's quite interesting is, in the worst case, your carving widths would be of the order of square root of n. And this just simply comes from the separation theorem of uh, planar graphs. Uh, so this gives us, if you fix your category, that gives you a sub-exponential time algorithm. If you don't want to talk parameterized complexity, you get sub-exponential time algorithms. And so far, we only knew them for the classical Jones polynomial and uh, recently for the Omfly uh, polynomial. So this work gives you this sub-exponential algorithm and parameterized time algorithm for all possible quantum invariants uh, you can construct with a strict ribbon category. So that gives you the Jones polynomial, all the colored Jones polynomial, the Humphrey polynomial, all the colored Humphrey polynomials, and many others. Like for every, uh, for every uh, uh, representation uh, of a Lie algebra, you can define families of uh, families of uh, invariance, so that gives you, if you fix one, that gives you uh, this uh, fixed parameter tractable algorithm to compute it. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Clement. So for the audience members, if you're able to, uh, please unmute yourself and let's clap. Speaker. <laughs> And we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? Clement, have you done yeah. this for B, for virtual nodes? For big, sorry? For virtual nodes? Um, virtual yeah. nodes in the sense of Kaufman. Uh, so the, sorry, the connection is that very good. Um, like the, what kind of nuts? Sorry? Virtual, virtual. Um, that's a good question. Um, would you be able, I haven't thought about it. Um, um, the construction is quite general. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure. I would need to think about it. Um, Yeah, I would say you can. Yeah, it's, I mean, it would, it works for, uh, I mean, it works in a general, fairly general uh, framework uh, of graphs and um, uh, and uh, invariants. So I reckon I, I look into it. That's actually an interesting question. But uh, yeah, the construction is quite general, so it may, may be possible. Want to comment, not a question, but thanks for a nice talk. Thank you very much.
Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks so much, Clement.